What up? Welcome to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. Thank you very much for joining me. Hope you enjoy the show. Be sure to check me out on Instagram at Two Tall Sports Podcast. Let's get it. All right, welcome back to another edition of Two Tall Sports Podcast with Brett Lauren, your host. And I have a very special guest today, my minor league buddy, Derek Idle, and he's with a company called Pando Pooling, uh, which gets players together to kind of help each other out in the future with investments in, in themselves. So uh, I wanted to get into that with him and uh, also give some background on his career and how, how we met. So uh, thank you for being with us today, Derek. How you doing? Hey, thanks for having me on. It's good to, good to talk to you again. I know, man. It's been a while. Yeah, we uh, we have we have some good stories from from Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> um, I wanted to get uh, before we get to Mobile, um, I wanted to get a little background on you. Um, just kind of where you're from, where where you went to school, all that stuff, if you could. Yeah, from Marshall, Illinois. It's a small town, um, central Illinois, about thirty five, four hundred, or thirty five hundred or four thousand people. Um, so just, uh, played three sports growing up, baseball, football, basketball, you know, a little roller hockey, just, you know, whatever the season was and whatever we could get our hands on. Um, and went to college at Rose Holman Institute of Technology, the Rose Holman. <laughs> the best school in Indiana. <laughs> yeah. It's the, uh, we're known as the MIT of the Midwest. Oh, Okay. Or maybe they're known as the the Rose Holman of the East. I don't remember. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, but uh, so it's a small Division three engineering school. I played football, baseball for, for uh, four years and got drafted in the 17th round in the 2010 draft. Okay. And a little known secret here. I've watched this guy play football on tape, all right? He's got it all. Dude can, <laughs> dude can, can sling it a little bit. What was, uh, what was it like playing – What's that? Don't get me started. Yeah, I know. <laughs> did you go to, to college mainly for football or did you go mainly for baseball? A uh, little bit of both. I, I had one walk-on opportunity at Eastern Illinois for baseball. Um, and I just decided that it was in my best interest to go to the stronger academic school um, and pursue that. And it was a, a plus that I could do both. Okay. Um, you know, at the division three level, I don't, I don't think I could have done it at, at a, you know, D one school or something. Yeah. It would have been hard. They would have wanted you to commit to one of those. Yeah. And my catcher actually in college was a Northwestern transfer and kind of that same deal. He was trying to do engineering, which is, you know, tougher major. He wasn't playing two sports, but just doing the engineering curriculum and you know, the baseball, he kind of had to make a decision and he wanted to keep playing. So he, he uh, went to a school where you don't have the same, responsibilities not being a scholarship athlete and a big 10 program right but yeah I, so it, it's hard to say but I always felt more like a football player in college but I think a lot of that was that was my first sport you know it's a fall sport when I first got there and so those were the the first friends I made and before I even really got to know the guys on the baseball team okay now when you were you went all four years there yeah now did you think getting drafted was a definitely a possibility what were your thoughts on the getting drafted for baseball um when that happened um my senior year of high school i had there was a bird dog scout i think he was with the orioles at the time darren blair who i actually introduced myself to him at a basketball tournament in the winter and he uh said that he was a baseball scout and i was like hey i play baseball you should come check me out. <laughs> and I had never like professional, like I, you know, dreamed of playing in the big leagues and all that stuff. But in high school, no part of me was like, I'm going to get drafted. Right. Uh, he's like, yeah, I'll come check it out. So he came down, saw me pitch in the spring and kind of planted a bug in me. You know, he's, he's like, you know, you could be a draft and follow potentially. And I think he was just being nice. Um, but he's like, you know, you, you're committed to a good school. Like go to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it it just kind of planted a seed that maybe I could do this. Um but I but I didn't go to college thinking like I need to get my draft stock up. It was just I'm going to 
play football and baseball and try to try to keep up with my studies. And, uh, you know, just, I, I was a very late bloomer, you know, just kind of worked hard and, you know, kind of got lucky. I, I, I have some funny stories about how I got drafted actually. Um, me and a couple of my teammates, one that was the Northwestern transfer and another guy, Tim Teepee, who was a, they were both all Americans, um, multiple years in college, but both position players, which is much tougher right. uh, at the D3 level because you're just facing subpar pitching and pitching is easier to evaluate regardless of competition. Right. Um, but we, you know, recruited ourselves to the scouts. We uh, made resumes. We got a Rolodex type thing <laughs> of scouts in the area. We just started calling them. We'd go to Indiana State games and where the scouts were and be like, hey, you want to come out to Rose Holman? And you know, we'd set up our own pro days and like half a scout would show up. And so like it was That's just awesome cool though. Thing. Why not? You're better. Yeah. Um, you know, eventually we got some scouts coming out and by my uh, senior year, I was doing a little bit harder and more scouts started coming. And so it was like a really cool atmosphere just on school because we don't normally have scouts. And, and so it was, it was cool. I'd say the best fact about you is that you're the only player drafted in any sport from Rolls Holman. That's got to be a cool feeling. Yeah. Uh, but most of the other graduates made a lot more than <laughs> in <their chosen> profession. <laughs> but still really cool. Yeah. I was, I was living the dream, uh, in a living with five other dudes in a two bedroom apartment, <laughs> but yeah. I would go and trade it. Yeah, definitely. And then your career, it, the, the journey started, right? So you get yeah. drafted by the D backs in, in 2010. Um, and I think you played your first season in Missoula, Montana. Is that right? Yep. That was my first team. Awesome. Love Missoula. I've never been to Montana, but I, I've I heard the Missoula. good fans there. Good fans there. Yeah, great fans. Okay. How was your experience? You're like, for most people that don't know the minor league lifestyle, that compared to college baseball, what was it like, the transition? Uh, it was awesome. I mean, it was, it's, you know, I was at a rigorous academic school that it's a little bit different atmosphere than like going to a state school and, and it's a small campus and people are very focused on their studies. They're not trying to play sports past college. Um, and so I just thought, pro ball was college without class is like the best yeah like you're around your buddies you're hanging out you're traveling around you, but you don't have that you know we got to be careful we got to get this test turned in tomorrow you know you're just having fun it's it's a great lifestyle right now coming out of the draft obviously you know you, most people don't get a huge signing bonus and i think that maybe propelled you to what you're going to be doing and we'll get to your job now in the future but um Minor league lifestyle is tough, as you know. So um, what, do you, what were your first couple of years like as far as dealing with that side of things? Uh, first, like I had a really supportive family um, that I, looking back, like probably allowed me to, like if I didn't have some support system, like I had student loans and right. I signed for $1,000 was my signing bonus before taxes. Uh, so after taxes, we went out to eat at Applebee's. <laughs> you treated? Yeah, spent, and I think we had to throw in a gift card at the end to make the, the check complete. Oh man, that's uh, great. <laughs> Love a good Applebee's, man. That's a my that's a minor league restaurant right there. It may have been an Outback. I, okay. I yeah, it was, it was all blur. Um, <laughs> but so, like, I want to preface it with that. If I didn't have that, like, I don't know how long I could have like made that decision to keep playing. Um, I worked jobs in the off season. My first off season, I worked at a carpet store, driving a forklift and cutting carpet and doing all that stuff. And then my next two off seasons, I worked uh, jobs that were more related to my education, um, some engineering design stuff. Uh, you know, because I I didn't know what was going to happen. I wanted to keep my resume up and also, but primarily make money. Like, uh, and then once I started playing winter ball, that was a huge. Um, kind of boom to my economic status. You know, I was able to kind of bridge that gap between seasons. Right. Um, I want to get to winter ball in a second, but I want to go back to you and I met in 2012, I think in Mobile, Alabama, right? That is correct. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, so that's Derek and I uh, formed our, our friendship then. And uh, I've known him yeah, about eight years now. So yeah, it's pretty cool. This, you know, the Southern League, it's double A. It's, you know, everybody's getting close. So what do you think of the jump to double A once you got there? Um, I didn't think it was that drastic. I always, and I, I don't know why this was, but I tended to do better at the, every level I went up. Um, my, you know, my numbers improved and I, part of that's just different players interact differently with like less disciplined hitters and the lower level. Sometimes they right. dominate it with their stuff. And then when they get up where guys are more selective and scouting reports and stuff are playing, uh, come into play more and people can execute a scouting report um, just as importantly. Yeah. And vice versa. So, it, it, you know, there's a lot that goes into play there, but you know, look at trying to look back on it and think what I thought it's hard because you're just doing it. I'm yeah. you're not thinking like, Oh, these guys are so much better. It's like, you know, I'm here. I belong. I'm here. Cause I'm good. So. Did you feel like once you got to double A, now we're like, it's hard to get to double A, but once you get there, you're like, all right, now I'm in the mix now. I got a shot. Yeah, absolutely. I remember in, in Visalia and high A, when guys would get called up to double A, it was like, they are going to Mecca. Right. And then, and, you know, your second, third year in double A, it doesn't feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, also you had, a, you and I had similar, like we went from being starters early in our career to being a reliever. And I think mm -hmm. that's also when you took off, right? When you became a full-time reliever and you just focused on that. Yeah. It was a, a strange transition um, in some ways, but I, I liked the, the mentality of relieving more to me mentally it was so much easier because I didn't like the the five days to think about the last start whether it was good or bad right um you know you, you just have a little bit too too much time for things to marinate um so I, I like get every single day going to the field like I might get in today and if I if I'm having a bad stretch like today I can turn it around or if I'm doing really well I want to keep it going um so it's just a a whole different animal pitching out of the pen and I pitched in basically every role you can pitch in, in my career. And, you know, I liked them all for different reasons. Yeah. I, and from my experience being a starter, I like the five day structure. I like this, the plan of it, the whole, like the, everything that goes in between certain days or this, this, and this, but I, I was, it was kind of a freedom too. When I became a reliever, like it's much yeah. less stress. You go in for one, maybe two innings at the most and you, you know, blow the doors off if you can, and then you're out of there. Yeah. And just like, once I moved to the pin, I just felt like I was so much more relaxed and I didn't like the, I wake up in the morning and it's like, it's my start day. Like I, I tried all kinds of different things to deal with that. I would, I, I started going to matinees on my, on my start day. I would just go to a movie by myself. Um, there was conveniently one right around the corner in mobile. Um, I actually remember going and I don't remember the movie and I don't cry that often, but <laughs> I was bawling and there's like three other people in the theater, you know, and, and it was just, I don't know. It, and I go into the field and I'm like, everyone's going to be able to tell I've been, been freaking crying. Did you so, emotionally drain before your start? I was, I think I pitched well that night. I was just like, you know, had other stuff on my mind. <laughs> but it, it's so, you know, you try to get in routines and you know, there's superstitions and, all things that go into it. But at the end of the day, like, you know, what's going to happen is what's going to happen. Um, you know, I, I agree I, with I, you though. I didn't like, I, st the morning of a start was the worst. You don't like, sometimes you don't sleep well. You're waiting all day to get to like the games at seven, you're up at nine. Like, what do I do all day? Like, I agree with you with that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, now I want to get to Mexico or playing in Venezuela also. So you got the chance to play winter ball, which for people that don't know. So in the off season, you can go play in the Latin countries or in Mexico, any of these places that offer winter ball and they pay really well to, for the foreign or American players that come down there. And there's only a few slots for each, um, foreign player. Um, but it's great exposure and it's the different baseball. So I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that and what that experience was like. Yeah, it's, I, I played for three different teams in Mexico across three years. Um, I played for three teams in the Dominican for, across two years and then one year in Venezuela. And it was the best. Like it, that was my big leagues looking back. And I, I knew it in the moment, like there's a lot of stuff in your career that 
you don't appreciate it at the time. And then looking back, you know, you, you kind of see it for what it was. And like, that was a cool moment. Like my, my first winter ball game, I was like, this is for me. <laughs> this is, uh, what was crap. different about that atmosphere than, than regular minor league baseball? Uh, it's the big leagues. Uh, like in simplest terms, you're there, you're in Mexico, you're in the Dominican Venezuela. That is their big league season. The, the big league guys come from here, the minor league guys, the top prospects, like the dudes, they're there. And that's their season that they grew up rooting for, uh, you know, the Magianas or Escajito or, or Hermosillo. Like those were the teams they rooted for. Like we think about the, I grew up a Yankee fan. Right. Like they're teams that the, the kids look up to and growing up, they want to play for their hometown team. And so the fans treat it that way. It's the big leagues. Like I, I know I said that like five times. No, it's um, but that's uh, I think the most apt way to describe it. It's serious baseball. It's not a developmental league. You don't go down there and work on a third pitch. You're going to be back home in in ten days. You go down there, you get results, or they send you home. And if you do well, you get results. You get treated like it. So you actually could feel it when you were there. Like every game mattered pretty much. Yeah, and it's a short season. I think it's sixty some games you know, instead of 162. So that condensed schedule creates urgency, just like, you know, 16 games in an NFL season is different than 82 games in the NBA and 162 in baseball. So you coming off value. Yeah. You're coming off of 142 games in the minors and then you're going 60, you're playing 200 games in a calendar year. Uh, I would usually do a half. Okay. So that's common. You'll go down for the first half from October to the end of November or from from December through however long your team's in the playoffs. Um, and I prefer doing the second half, which I had, I think I did the first half my first two years, and then I started doing the second half. And so I would take a little bit of time off after the season and then ramp it up, and I would go down to winter ball. You throw a few pins. They, they give you a little bit of time to, to get going, but you go down there ready to go. Um, you, you might get down there, and you're starting the next day. Um, Wow. So, but I would use that as a, as a leap into spring training. And there's no doubt in my mind, I had made teams out of spring training because I was coming down in mid season form. Well, I was going to ask you about that. Like, how did your, how, you know, that's a lot of games to even just in, just in travel in general and season to come back and be ready for spring training right away. You felt like it was better for you. Oh yeah. And all this was too, I didn't start playing winter ball till I was a reliever. So, you know, it's, it's not like I was throwing 150 innings in the States and then trying to go down there and wear myself out. I, you know, I was throwing 70, 80 innings, I think. And, and I was built up as a starter. Like that's what I'd done my whole life. So I, I, I was ready to go. And okay. my arm was better the more I just kept it going like little breaks here and there, but I like to throw. Okay. That's great. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, we'll be right back after this, and we'll come back with part two with Derek Idle, and we'll talk about Pando pooling right after this. All right, thanks, Brett. All right, welcome back. Part two of our episode with Derek Idle, my minor league buddy. Um, he's with a company called Pando, and I want to let him introduce that and kind of tell you what it's about. It's a really interesting concept, and uh, I think it'd be a, a, good, um, a good topic to go through as far as how it works in the minors and how these guys coming up can, can help each other. So with that, I'm going to give you the floor. What is Pando, and how did you get involved with it? Uh, I got recruited by them to come on as an external rep. Uh, about 20 months ago, almost, almost two years ago. Um, and right from the get go, it was something that, you know, resonated with me, what they were doing. My first reaction was I spent a lot of time in the bullpen talking about everything under the sun and this never came up. Like, so I was very disappointed in myself, first of all, that, <laughs> that I didn't come up with this, but uh, our, our founders came up with a, with a really good idea. Um, Charlie Olson, Eric Lax, they're two Stanford MBA grads. And, you know, they were, they were looking at the economy and seeing where 
more people are being forced into winner take all career paths where there's going to be a small amount that really uh, absorb a lot of the gains within that industry. And there's going to be a lot of people that are on the outside looking in, but when they all start in that endeavor, they're on very equal footing and you don't know the results of that, what's going to happen down the line. And so you can, you can see how that would apply to baseball very well. Um, baseball is a, a, a mirror of that. It's the 2%, huge, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a huge disparity of, of the haves and have nots. And that disparity does not reflect the talent differential um, between a player that makes uh, no money in the big leagues that gets up to double A, triple A, knocks on the door, and the player that makes a hundred million. That guy is not a hundred million times better than that guy. I agree with that. It's razor thin. Um, anyone with a uniform has a lot of ability, and they can do something well. And it could be a, a small adjustment. Um, or the right situation and the organization believes in them and they're the ones that are going, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a, there's a thousand reasons. It's not that, you know, the guys in the big leagues just worked harder than the guys in the minor leagues. Um, you know, everyone's working hard and everyone's trying to achieve their dream, but it's just not going to work out for everybody. Right. It's, it's a numbers game and it's just a reality of the sport. And so yeah. Ando is set up for players to handle that risk on a, in a smarter way to where instead of that consolidated risk, every player is just a hit or miss prospect. You either make it big time or you don't. And our platform allows players to group together. They, they choose each other. It's a, it's a mutual agreement between players that have similar projected earnings. So think a uh, second round pick with other second round picks, fifth rounders with fifth round type guys and and you know later round undrafted players with those types of players and that that's very clean um that's an over -simpli simplification of of how our pools get formed but that's just a kind of an easy way to think about it that it's not a first rounder subsidizing a 10th round pick um to where they're in the same pool with each other um so the players are able to form these pools with us there's there's no cost to one to have like a consultation with us and be able to see options within our platform that a player has, which, which we have over 300 players right now on our platform. And about two thirds of those are inactive pools. Um, so players are able to check out their options and see if there's a fit for them within our system. And once players join a pool, there, there still is no cost to that, but it's the players getting together and all agreeing that they're going to contribute some percentage we we have our pool recommendations but um all, all most of these numbers are malleable depending on what the group wants to do um so but our record our standard pool recommendation is that players contribute 10 percent of their earnings once they reach arbitration which generally takes three years of big league service time to get to arbitration and it's technically an income hurdle of 1.6 million but three years at the minimum is, is about that number. And that's where that comes from. So if none of the players make it to the big leagues in that pool, nothing happens. Correct. Okay. Yeah. No money changes hands. And that, that's important for the way that, that our business is set up that, you know, players in the minor leagues, we're not asking them to pay for, pay up front for this diversification because there's no product yet. Right. We, and we don't take a fee until we've delivered that product and, and a pool has distributions. Um, so it's a tool for the players to, again, get, ri get rid of the consolidated risk, which at almost any stop of economics, you don't want consolidated risk. You know, companies, businesses have insurances and contingency plans and diversification in, in different sectors and the individuals within that are diversifying their stock portfolio, but players are asked to take on all that risk solo with, with no safety net, no, no fallback plan. And, you know, it's as a saying that uh, Dan Duquette says, who, who works with Pando um, longtime GM in the big leagues is the players, the pilot of their jet plane, you know, you're in control. Whatever's going to happen is, is you're controlling the plane. But if something goes wrong, Pando's your parachute. And a lot of times 
by the time you need, you know that you need a parachute, you better hope you have that parachute in place. It's, it's too late. Um, and you know, it gives guys a soft landing. Cause it's, again, it's, it's a numbers game. It's not about ability or a player not believing in themselves. It's, the fact that other players believe in them just as much as they believe in the guys that are in their pool with them that look around, we're all potential big leaguers. And so let's, let's uh, circle up and protect each other going forward and say, let's, uh, let's create a, a better set of financial outcomes for everyone in this. Now, how do you, um, I know obviously you're talking to players, what, what, you know, is it college guys, summer ball, where do you start getting these guys to form the pools? Um, Players can't, our clients have to be professional players, um, but we do do some, some outreach to the amateur side. We spent time um, at the area code games and some of that, a lot of that was just agent networking, um, talked to some parents and stuff, but you know, we're not really talking to high schoolers directly. Right. Yeah. It's um, too soon. Yeah. But, it, but I think it is important that just the education of our product, you know, we want to encourage financial literacy and just thinking differently about what a career in, in professional sports is. It's a career, it's a business. And Pando offers players to make a, a savvy business decision and, and how they approach their career and how they value that first million dollars versus the million dollars that gets you from 49 to 50 million. You know, the, the utility money. And that first million is vastly more important than even $5 million to get you from 95 to 100. So for, I know you have a good example with the, uh, John Carlos Stanton, let's just say he's a $300 million player, whatever he makes it. The, so he has to put in a per, certain percentage. And if he's in a pool with other guys that make it, they'll put in a percentage too, that are all past that third year arbitration in the big leagues. The rest of the guys that didn't make it all started the same as him, but they have some funding to help them. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, so that, I want to make it clear he had John Carlos Stanton is not a client of ours. Not a, right. Just an example. Yeah. But this is a, we do a lot of historical mock pools and we show what would have happened if picks 10 through 20 of the first round had pooled when they got drafted and over and over, you see the same results. Um, all 10 of those guys did not go on to have the career you would expect from a top 20 pick. Obviously, you know, the expectations are very high for those players for good reason. They have a lot of ability and they're very projectable but then your career starts and some guys have that meteoric rise they they don't hit any hiccups and they're hitting arbitration by the time they're 25 years old yeah. 24 or super twos and you know off they go um but inevitably that is not the case for for all 10 of those guys and so you see over and over uh in the case of a pool like that we would expect about half of those players to clear arbitration. Um, so it's going to be a, basically that coin flip. And the, and the coin flip analogy I like to use is if I gave you two coins, one coin is 50 million for heads and zero for tails. And the other coin is 45 million for heads and 5 million for tails. Which one would you want to flip if you get one chance? I'll take the 45 million with the $5 million parachute. <laughs> that, that's most, uh, most players, most people's, answer to that that's the the logical answer right uh, so that goes back to for instance like in a common objection probably let's just say the one guy that makes it is the one kind of contributing the most right so mm -hmm. what i know when you hear that objection what do you say to someone that says well the guy that's making it is has taken on all the risk mm -hmm. well th let's say there's a pool of 10 guys and you know we don't have a crystal ball that's why we exist no one no one does Right. If you knew what was going to happen, you wouldn't need insurance security. Um, but that's not the case. But if that happened, that would be a, an outlier to where only one of those players, we would expect five of them to. But, you know, but that is a result that we would 100% stand behind. We have a 90% client profit rate. And the guy who, let, let's say he made $100 million in his career, so he would be putting $10 million into the pool but he's still an owner in that. So he, he would get his share of that back. So he goes, you know, worst case scenario, you make $91 million instead of a hundred. Which I think most guys would be okay for. Plus you're helping out other guys that were just like you that easily could have made it just like you. And you're the one right. that made it. And that's, that's the whole key to this is 
the only reason those nine players are getting those distributions from that player is because they were willing to be that guy. That's what they're signing up for. Like, I'm okay with that trade off. If it means we have uh, nine guys who became millionaires over again, regardless of what they signed for. Um, and this money also is flowing from, uh, you know, the, the pools start the flow of money. The distributions happen in real time to the players as the money's being earned. So you're thinking these nine guys that didn't make it, um, maybe they, some of them had injuries, maybe some of them just uh, for whatever reason didn't end up having that big league career that they'd hoped they would. Um, but they're getting this, that almost million dollar safety net over the course of 10 years, maybe from age 25 to 35, while that player's signing those huge deals and, you know, being a big leaguer. He's accruing service time that, you know, he's going to have a, a sizable pension when all things are done. If you make $100 million, you played a long time in the big leagues. Um, so you're accruing that service time that, that we don't touch. You don't, you know, obviously a pension or anything like that. That player is going to have off-field earning opportunities. Um, none of those things are subject to pool contributions. So that, that player is going to have so many different sources of revenue that uh, any losses from a pool I don't think will be felt in his life. Now, how long are the players in the pool? How does it work once they're all in it and all that stuff? Uh, the pool lasts until the last player in the pool retires, and then it's, it's dissolved. Um, we do have a cap in place. So our – and, again, this is something that can be adjusted depending on the um, – the preference of the pool, but we can, our standard cap is $20 million in contributions. So if a player makes $200 million after arbitration, uh, he's put his 20 million, his 10% of that into the pool. Everyone in that pool is very fortunate to have been in that pool. Um, his obligation is through of contributions. So if he makes another hundred million dollars in his career, he keeps a hundred percent of that but he is still subject to distributions from the pool. So if other people are, are earning and putting it in, he's still getting those distributions for as long as the pool exists. Right. Now, um, I know you guys have to obviously make money and do it, make a business. So you, I think uh, you said 99% stays with the players. Is that right? You guys take a 1% fee? Yeah. So our, our fee is tied to the pool. So we are an owner just like all the other players in the pool. We own 10%. So it's, a 10% ownership and a 10% contribution. So it's essentially a 1% post arbitration fee. Um, so when you factor in the players, each individual player keeps their first 1.6 million over 99% of major league earnings stay with the players. There's, there's not a scenario where that changes. Now, how do you, do you guys help the players pick? What if, you know, what if these guys never meet the other guys that are in their pool and they're not sure if that's a good fit for them? Like maybe they're, they're the only one that they think is going to make it out of that pool or whatever. Mm -hmm. But how do you guys work with the, the players getting into pools? So the first step is players can sign up to our platform, which is basically a no cost look at what your options are within Pando. Um, so let, let's say you were a fifth round pick in 08. So let's say I talked to a, a young, handsome Brett Lauren, fresh out of Long Beach State. Still talking to a handsome Brett Lauren, but go ahead. <laughs> You're more dignified now. <laughs> I'm distinguished. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so I, I talked to you, um, let's say this, the first off season, you got drafted, you went to rookie ball, uh, you pitched really well. You had a, let's say, you, I don't know how you're, your first pro ball experience went, but let's say you just pitched really well. So, and I talk to you and you say, Hey, this sounds interesting, Derek. I would like to see my options. So <laughs> that, that's as simple as it is. We, you sign a platform agreement with us that gets you onto our platform that the, the only binding part of that contract is confidentiality because any uh, proposals that we make to you involve other real players that we have the same agreement in place with. Yeah. So you sign up, and then I talked to you a week later, and we now have some options for you. Um, we have two pools that have maybe a third round pick from the year you were drafted, a, a two other fifth round picks that have performed well, and two guys that are in double A. They're three years older than you, but they've, they're in double A and they're organizational all stars last year. They're a pool of five. And they want you to join their pool. We've already discussed it with them since you signed onto the platform. 
we took you to the pool leader and he said, yeah, we, we want some Brett Lauren in our pool. So now we show you those individuals. We can, we can introduce you, um, you know, all those things. Cause you're, okay. you're going to make an agreement with these guys. If, if you decide that's what you want to do. Um, so let's say you look at it, but you, for whatever reason, this isn't the right fit for me. Um, because I, I have a group of guys that I got drafted with actually out of Long Beach state that we want to start our own pool. So we get those guys together and okay. we set this up for you guys. We set up the contract. We're, we're going to enforce it down the line. When it happens, we're going to make sure the money flows correctly. Um, so we have conversations with those players, maybe of the six you wanted to do it, four of them are in. So you guys get going. And if you want to add more players to that pool, you, you played with a guy in rookie ball who, who you think would be a good fit, get them in. We, we talk to them. You can make an intro. Um, you don't have to. Like, we, we have our own channels to talk to players. But, you know, that's how a lot of these are built. They're, they're social things just as much as they are financial. Now, how do you guys – is there any dealing with agents where they might want – their agency to be in a pool together or stuff like that. How do you deal with going direct to players and also dealing with their agents too? Uh, we, we try to go direct to players as much as possible. Our, our product is for players. It's for their benefit. And, you know, at the end of the day, the player is the CEO of his startup. He, you know, they hire an agent, they hire a financial advisor, all those things. But the player at the end of the day is the decision maker. Um, but having said that, we have really good relationships with a lot of agents and we try to try to be as transparent as possible in this process. And agents can help us out a lot and helping your agent can help you evaluate that pool proposal that we made to you and look at them and say, Hey, Hey Brett, these guys, you know, it makes sense, but they're a little bit older. Like you're younger. I'd, I'd rather see you get with younger players or you're younger. And he says, Hey, I'd rather see you get with guys that are a little bit more established and have proven they can, pitch it or pitch or hit at upper levels and you know so you can have that that discussion and he can be very involved in that process and that helps things a lot when that's the case so not only at, uh, we've talked about this before with just not with baseball but also in startups and silicon valley and stuff like that your founders are are from the area and so they kind of have that mindset this could also work with professionals in business too right right uh we've launched our business vertical which is set up for entrepreneurs, startups, uh, MBA grads, people that are, you know, they're not wanting to do a desk job. They're trying to innovate, take risks within the marketplace to reap the rewards. But that risk is a barrier of entry to a lot of people. And especially with, you know, a lot of, a lot of individuals coming out of school, if they, if you hadn't gotten your MBA, you're, you probably have some student loans. Um, and, if you're starting your own company, what your assets, your capital, you're putting into your company to grow it. Um, and so we, we have a platform for people to diversify that risk in a way that doesn't take up front capital. You're, you're not having to, to buy stocks. You're buying stocks with you, with your future uncertain upside. And you're doing it with other individuals that you believe in. And so it, it's set up a little bit differently. It's, it's, it's not a cumulative income hurdle it's a they can be set up again in different ways with depending on the the preference of the pool members but it could be a deal to where five people from an mba class that are friends are all starting their own companies they're all interesting things they but they can also acknowledge that startup companies have a high fail rate and but we believe in this individual whatever he does he's he's going to be successful one way or another who knows if if he ends up living comfortably or starts a billion dollar company, but he's going to work hard. I believe in him and I want to make this agreement. And so it's typically a yearly income hurdle. So if you and I started a pool, we could say, Hey, we want this pool to be set up. Um, and I work for a startup, you, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're pursuing, obviously it would be something with, with a lot of upside um, and risk, but we're wanting to go into this together. And we set it to where we don't contribute until we make $200,000 in income in a given year. And we've agreed to put 5% of anything after that into our pool with the idea in mind that one of us could be at a company that hits a windfall in 10 years. And maybe things didn't work out for the other one, but 
we understood that was a possibility and it could be a possibility for both of us. We could both um, strike it rich, in which case it's basically a wash. You lose your fee and you both move on. You, you know, you won. Still made a ton of money, right? <laughs> You're good. You, you paid a small premium for a policy that thankfully neither of you needed. And I think that makes a lot of sense because a lot of, you know, doing a startup or having any business is is a huge risk and it's, you know, there's a lot of failure involved, but this kind of allows you to pursue those dreams without having to worry so much about what ifs at the end. Right. Exactly. Um, A a baseball analogy I like to use is, and and this is a little bit of hyperbole, like everyone's different, but um, if you don't make it, if you don't end up having a career in the big leagues, like you're going to be broken bitter when you leave this game. And with Pando, you can just be bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So you can have a little cash even though you didn't make it. Yeah, you know, it didn't work out. Uh, but, but on a serious note, like, it's, it's real. Like when the game's over, it's over. And it's for a very sele- – I remember Dan Carlson. You remember DC. Um, pitching coach in double A's. I believe the pitching coordinator now for the Diamondbacks. Um, but he was talking about how when when your time in this game is over, like baseball moves on so fast, it'll make your head spin. And if you think for one second that you're going to be missed, like as soon as you're out the door, they got someone taking your locker. And it, and it doesn't matter if, if you didn't make it past low A or if you played 15 years in the big leagues. Like, you know, big poppy retires, the game goes. The Red Sox still play games. They play 162 a year out and outside of right now, but the fans still show up. They have a new, you know, the new team favorite and it's not to diminish anyone's role in the game, but it's just reality. It's a, it's a machine that keeps on rolling. Right. And to understand that when that's over, we can provide some financial security and financial freedom to maybe instead of going into a job right away, because you know, a lot of players, when they leave this game, they're married, they have kids potentially, or they're just at a different stage in their life. Um, but maybe you have some pool distributions that allow you to go back to, and finish school without having to, to work two jobs. Um, or maybe hold out for that job that is a little bit more appealing, like more passionate about rather than I got to get a job. Like I just got to do something. I need to start earning because I have responsibilities. And, you know, it's, it's real effects of, you know, we talked a little bit about how if, if you go from a hundred million to 95 million, it, it doesn't really affect the way you live your life. But if you don't make anything and you end up getting 200 grand, a million, 50 grand from your pool, that's, that's going to be life changing money and things that really do affect um, your quality of life in a time that that's tough for players. I totally agree. And when you first told me about the concept, I was, I kind of was just thinking about it. I wasn't sure, but the more we talk about it, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, like the guy that hits it big, he'll be totally fine. And the guys that don't make it, they are probably going to get at least a chunk of what they should have made while they were playing. Cause as you know, minor leaguers make nothing in their career for the most part. So I think it's great for both. Yeah. You're, you're creating a, set of outcomes that creates a much higher likelihood that you get a good return on investment for your career. And, you know, me speaking personally, there's, there's just the fact that you're not getting paid much in the minor leagues. And then you compound that with, you can't really do anything outside of that. Like you can, in the off season, you got to find some temporary job. So it's not like you can, you're only can't start a career. Right. So you're just doing something to get by to, to, like fill that gap and then you compound it with the opportunity costs. Like, you know, I I went to a good engineering school and you know, the guys that I graduated with were off making six figures out the gate out of school and they've climbed the ranks. They've built a resume. They're, you know, now executives, professionals within their industries. And that's a, that's a real cost of pursuing baseball. Um, You know, if things work out great like that, like it really is like it makes me happy when guys succeed and even guys that you're on the same team with when you want to be the one getting called up you're still happy for those guys oh yeah um, we all know how it goes and it, on it and you're right and you play you know we i played for seven years you played for what nine years right in the minors yeah. okay so we just spent seven and nine years of not building a real life resume 
-hmm. You know, like that's a tough thing to start at late twenties, early thirties and go, all right, now you're in the real world. Right. It's a, and every, not everyone, but I feel like it's a common theme that because I played professional sports, I'm going to get a good job because it's cool. Like it's people and people will talk to you and like, Oh yeah, it might get you in the door, but it might get you in the door. But at the end of the day, how does you playing baseball make me money and for me to hire you? And of course you learn, you know, you can talk to people. Uh, it's, it's a cool icebreaker sometimes, you know, yeah. I'm not one of those guys. I don't lead with that. I don't either. Cause then it, the conversation doesn't end. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, the common lines, like I know how to handle failure and struggle and all, but if you're saying that in an interview, what are you telling the interviewer? You didn't play professional baseball, so you can't handle failure. You know, yeah. so it's baseball sports. They teach you lots of life lessons and, you know, but it's a real opportunity cost when you, when you break it down and, you know, some guys forego education, um, going to college. And we also have a, a pretty strong presence within the Latin American market. And, and in a lot of ways with my experience in winter ball, you know, it's, it's uh, something that uh, I feel really strongly about. Like we can help these guys to set themselves up for success they're not all going to succeed. They're not all going to have long careers. It doesn't matter if you're a top prospect or you sign for $5,000. You there's going to be it's you know the success rates are going to vary, but it's never 100%. And there's going to be guys that go back to tough situations where you know they've been in the academy since they were 16 years old, they signed they um in that you know similar in the states guys go to high school, but it's it's a different world. Um the, that those players go back to and that that's something that I think me playing winter ball really exposed me to in ways that I was only kind of peripherally aware of it, but going down there seeing it, it and they're such good people they're you know a lot of my good friends that I played with are from the Dominican Venezuela Mexico and you know they're good people and I I think that our company can help set them up for success and and circle up and keep that money amongst each other right um so where do we if people wanted more information where do we find you guys uh our websites pandopooling.com uh i'm on social media um we we have a few podcasts out there you can youtube there's there's some videos um but yeah look us up we're, we're happy to talk to people and i i just like talking about what we do it's innovative and it's it's good to think about. It's a different way to think about what I think some people perceive is the status quo. And we do it this way because that's how we've done it. And you know, I think there I think there's a better way to to handle the risks in a professional baseball career now. And um and, and I also commend players that are willing to have a a conversation about this with an open mind because I get it. Like, you know, guys are told to put the blinders on. Um, and so we, we don't take that lightly. Like we, we have to be professional. We have to do our jobs correctly and, and in a way that put, really does put the player first. Totally. Well, I'll definitely help your stuff out. If you want to reach out to me also at two tall sports podcast, or you can, uh, look up Pando pooling, um, and you can get all the information you need there. But, um, thank you very much for your time. It was great to catch up and, uh, I'll definitely be talking to you soon. Yeah, man, it's good talking to you. Thank you.